Okay, it's been about 30 or 40 seconds, so hopefully the first commercial is done. Hi, everybody. It's, uh, of course, Wednesday evening, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And, uh, oh, wow, it's hot out here tonight. Um, give me just a second here. Yes, pull something to drink. Hmm. Hmm. No, it's pretty good. Tonight's beverage is watermelon punch. With a, a shot of Parrot Bay coconut rum in it. It's pretty tasty. Mmm. So, anyway, I'd like to thank everybody for turning out tonight. It's wonderful to see you all here. I know you've got all different kinds of choices about where you can spend your time, what you're going to watch. And I'm glad you decided to stop by and say hello this evening. Uh, I was just watching, um, I was watching Timcast, I think it was, Timcast IRL. Yeah, yeah, the debate about that that recent Supreme Court decision is still going on. I don't think we want to talk about, talk about that tonight, though. Hmm. We are going to talk about um, the new stuff that's going on. Um, a while back, a while back, uh, some folks were, were asking about a book on making food for us, and I stuck my foot in my mouth and said I, I would write it, and... Uh, uh, David over at Good Books said, okay, I'll publish it. And so we're <laughs> we're doing it. I'm in the midst of uh putting together the uh the the food forest tree lists right now. I've already got the canopy trees done. I got 24 different canopy trees for temperate food forests, uh both uh, uh cooler climate temperate and warmer time climate temperate and everything right in the middle. So we've got it, we've got it subdivided from from the the cool, the cool temperate climates, the warm temperate climates, and everything that's in the middle. So depending upon where you are in the world, you should have an easy time looking through there and finding things that will work for where you're at. Um, there's 24 different canopy trees, 33 different understory trees, and I was in the midst of doing the shrubs. Uh, this was yesterday. I was in the midst of doing the shrubs, and then I realized I needed to do some some alteration to the, to the key in the list. I'm, I'm including a key, so whenever you're going through the list, you can look at the very end of, of the entry for whatever it happens to be and, and go, okay, this is a this is a monoecious plant, which means it's you know it's it's got uh, uh, male and female flowers both on the same tree, and then whether or not it's fertile or self-fertile or not self-fertile. That way you'll know if you need something to cross-pollinate with. And then after that, the specific use that it's for. So for example, if it's an edible, an edible tree or something that produces produces food, it'll have a little E there. If it's a uh, Something that attracts pollinators will have a P plus the the bloom time. I'm going to put down the months, the the span of months that's in bloom. So if you're trying to attract pollinators, um, you will be able to use that information. And then if it has if it has additional function, like as a nitrogen fixer, that'll be also in there as well. So all this information will be right right there whenever you're going through the list to make it very 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 easy to do your design. We'll start out with canopy because that's going to be the thing on the top that catches the sun first. So you can sit down literally with your paint program, just draw little circles and go, okay, this is going to be a, this is going to be a pecan tree over here. This one's going to be a monkey puzzle tree, but it's dioecious. So I need both the male and the female. So this one's going to be a male. And I'll put the two females, one here, one here. And this leaves me the space over here so I can put these understories and it'll be great. Anyway, um, I was in the midst of doing the shrubs. And I think I'd gotten to maybe 40 different types of shrubs and nowhere near to the end of them. And I, I was going to do an alteration, like I said, to the key because I was writing hermaphroditic and monoecious and dioecious all the way out. And I realized I was going to need more space per line. Uh, so I tried to do a substitution. So every time it said hermaphroditic, we're going to replace it with an H, just the letter H whenever it said hermaphroditic. Um, well... <laughs> <laughs> that's whenever my uh, my editor program decided to crash on me and I, I I had the the misfortune of getting all excited about being in the project that I was in the midst of doing that I had not saved for a while so I had to start all over 
<laughs> so I started all over and I came back and I did it better. I added more, I added more trees to the, to the canopy list. I added more trees to the, to the, uh, to the understory list. Uh, I expanded the key and I added more information. So getting better and better and better. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I'll probably launch into, into doing the, the, the shrubs in, in earnest tomorrow. We want to, I, okay, let me back up. I want to get all of the lists done as quickly as possible. That way I can send them in and we can start looking for people to get the illustrations done because there should be an illustration for all of these. So it'll, it, it'll be a book with pictures. <laughs> hmm. So as soon as I can get the list done, the sooner we can start shopping for, for illustrations so the book will have all, all the illustration place that it needs. And then the rest of the writing, that's not difficult. Um, it's pretty much already done up here. I just have to finish doing the data entry and then putting all the parts together and we're off to the races. So, hi. Hi. How are you all doing tonight? Um, I've got a few other things to share with you today. Of course, I wanted to talk about the reason why Ravinia Pseudo Acacia, the black locust, didn't make the cut, even though even though it's a, it's a superstar tree, it's, 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 it's edible. If you cook, you know, the parts that are edible, toxic, if you don't, uh, attracts pollinators, fixes nitrogen, really good wood for, for, for making furniture. It's burns hotter than a whole lot of other stuff. You're using it for firewood. I mean, this is all around generally a good tree. The one big drawback it's got aside from, aside from having, the nastiest thorns imaginable on it. <laughs> They'll just reach out and cut you whenever you're walking by. The only other major drawback it has is it's it's very invasive, or at least it is here. But anyway, get to that in a minute. Real quick, I'm going to go up here and look at comments and say hello to everybody. Um, got Vicky in the house. Hello, John Puffrey in the house. Blake Bittner's here. Ken Jennings is here. Hey, y'all. He says Tiffany Q, Q2U is saying hi. I have I have to head to my hubby's live, but we'll have to thumbs up and the ads play. Have a great night. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. John's still container gardening. <laughs> Add food. All right. Oh. Let's see. I need a second one, Clover. I haven't even gotten to to, to the vining plants and to the, uh, to the ground covers. But, yeah, some of those are going to be good for pollinators, pollinators as well. And Clover, of course, is nitrogen pisser as well. Um, <laughs> so, oh, pot of coffee today. I, I think I'm on my second or third, maybe. I don't know. Um, da -da. do that with AutoCAD. Oh, yeah. Oh, the the locusts everywhere in Texas. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're 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 they're, they're pretty big down there, but. It, I was getting to that point in um, getting to that point in the understory trees where I I, I, I was going to have to make some cuts because um, the, the the way I've got the page format laid out, uh, I've got enough room for the you know the the, the heading at the top of the page and then it says you know the, the the cool cool temperate climate trees and then a space and then the list of those another space and then uh, a line that says you know temperate climate trees space all of those space warm temperate climate trees space all of those and then a couple of spaces before the, the the number that's supposed to appear at the bottom of the page and there's just enough room if i'm if i'm typing this up in uh in 12 point times new roman with it with a with an 11 11 inch uh page which is pretty industry standard for 33 entries and I realized I could go well over 33 entries, but I didn't really have 66 good entries to make it two pages long. And I don't really want to do 66 pages of illustration and description of understory tree for 66 different trees. I've already got quite a few coming up in shrubs, which are going to take up at least probably two pages worth. So I had to go through it and and look at the look at the, the the last set that I was that I was examining, and they were all nitrogen fixers. The, the, the last the last bit that I was going through because I I'd gotten around to them a little bit late, and I was making that decision. I was like, okay, 
we could do with uh, the mimosa, you know, the 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 Albizio Jubilee. I can't pronounce that Jubilee. Albizio Jubilee. Uh, mimosa, which is which is a good general all around like zone three to zone nine, or maybe zone four to zone nine uh, tree. Nice, pretty pink flowers. They're in bloom right now, as a matter of fact. It attracts the pollinators, same as the same as the locust does. Uh, they're they're available a little bit later in the season than the locust tree is, and this is important because a little bit earlier in the season, if you're going with the same list, I've got Circus canadensis, which is the, the eastern red bud, also zones three to nine, and those are coming on early. They're out already at the time that the that the locust flowers begin begin to bloom. So whenever the Circus canadensis goes away, then we've got uh, mimosa popping up. Uh, yes, Vicky, I put jujubes in there. Um, they were, they were the last thing I, I I put in before before I started working on uh, uh, strictly pollinators and strictly uh, nitrogen fixers. So anyway, and maybe it's a little bit of familiarity breeds contempt because we have so many black locusts around here and I, I have to deal with them all the time. I mean, they're they are a superstar tree. You just if you've got them in your landscape, you're going to have to to uh, be resigned to being um, on on weed patrol pulling up thorny plants for the rest of eternity. <laughs> They're there, and uh, they do a good job. Um, suppose if you have a problem keeping your keeping your, uh, your organic matter in your soil and you need to build a web of roots underground, so if you have really super sandy soil, then you might want to have more locusts or things like it that, that have that, that running tendency. Uh, real quick, let me do something with these boxes that are around here. We're going to open up a couple of packages to show you what we've what we've been getting. Um, this big thing over here, you might recognize this kind of box. But this arrived not too long ago. Wait, I've actually been reinvesting some of the some of the YouTube money in in uh, little projects, and this is one of them. Does anybody know what this is that I'm getting ready to pull out? Anybody? Anybody? Not you, Mary. You already know. I know you know. No boxes. She says, I'm not opening up any of yours, Mary. <laughs> I'm not opening up uh, anything that you ordered. Lord only knows what you get out of one of those. David says, chalkboard. That's a, that's a good guess, but no. Oy. Vicky says, in my experience, most thorny plants have contents valuable enough to defend. You know, that's exactly right. And I'll probably talk about that in, at length here in a bit. And I might even add a little segment about that in the book when I start describing the reason why certain things are the way they are. Kind of like learning to appreciate. Oy. I do appreciate nature. All right, so this is, oh, this is a 100 watt solar panel. These around about oh, 80 to 90 dollars on Amazon, 100 watts each. Da -da -da -da. Jeez, I think this was a Monte Cristo. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so this makes two of those that we've got so far. Let me just put this over here to the side for a moment. So, 100 watt solar panel over the course of a day is going to get you at a very minimum about 250 volts, or not 250, 250 watts of power. At the minimum, you'll get 250. I mean, it's a cloudy day, not the best circumstances, stuff like that. You'll get 250, and you can get up to like 400, maybe a bit more. On, on a good day. So at the very least, you, you'll get 250. So if you want to guarantee that you're going to get one full kilowatt, you'll need four of those. So four times $90 is $360 per, per kilowatt that you want to produce. That's not too bad. This thing, we also got along with it. This is a charge controller. $13, I think it is. Looks about like that. 
and I already have a few of these. I just I like to have spares just in case something goes wrong with one. That and I can hook up multiple systems and have them not connected to each other in case of emergencies or accidents and things of that nature. What else do we get? I got a couple of rolls of this. This is uh, uh, some 16-gauge wire. It's suitable for a 12-volt outside landscape lights and stuff like that. Naturally, of course, we got a few lights, right? Let's see. We got these guys. Check this out. All right. So this is a 10-watt, 12-volt landscape light. All right. And I've already got one that I've wired up. Got it wired up to a 12-volt plug. Just so we can do a little quick test with it to see how it works. A little miniature 12-volt power supply has this little output here, so I can plug that right on in there. And then if I turn it on, boo! I've got I've got a decent landscape light here. Uh, turn it back off. There we go. So that's uh, 10 watts, right? So 10 watts at 12 volts is like. 0.84 amps all together if you're adding up your ampers. I know it's weird. Uh, batteries, 12-volt batteries have amp hours. Um, speaking of which, boy, we got some more of those right here. Now, right now, I've got a little pump that's running the, the aerator for, for our fish out there. It's running off of one, one solar panel with two of these batteries tied up in parallel. I just ordered up another another four of them. So that's six all together. Wait. Hang on. Well, the rest of them are still down there in the bottom. I'll get those out later. But let's just go ahead and get this thing out of its box. All right. So there's a fresh new battery. This is a lead acid battery, right? It's not a... Uh, it's not a, a lithium ion phosphate battery. So it's bigger, it's bulkier, it's heavier, but it's one heck of a lot cheaper. It's less likely to uh, to have a catastrophic, catastrophic failure and blow up on me. And even better, no small children had to be enslaved to make it which is, I don't know about you guys, but it's kind of important to me that we don't, that we don't, uh, we don't support slave labor. All right, so here we go. Here's regular old lead acid battery. Mine lead right here. Make the acid right here. All right, sulfuric, sulfuric acid and lead. It's a sealed battery. This is tw a 22 amp hour battery. Just angle down a little bit there. Get this out of the way. So this is a 22 amp hour battery. These were, it's uh, 180, 190 for four of them. All right, so real quick, I'm just gonna hook this up. Watch this, this is fun. If I don't drop things on the floor, that is. All right, so I'll just check and see if it's, We'll check and see if this battery is working. All right, so I just attached a connector to it, and ding! Yep, there we go. So 10 watts, 10 watts, um, it's 0.84 amps, give or take, which means off of a 22 amp hour battery, if we only ran it for half of the amount of charge that the battery has, because you don't want to discharge the battery more than half during a charge cycle, we could run one of these for 13 hours. So let's assume that we had two batteries for each each 100 watt solar panel. Four solar panels, eight batteries gives us the ability to charge one full kilowatt and they have two kilowatts worth of uh, electricity on storage. We could have eight of these running all night long off of that. And they're you know bright enough that we can light up the outside pretty well and 
And that's the bare minimum amount of charge that we get off of those. So they're all of our excess power capacity can go to doing things like running the uh, running the pumps for the irrigation systems and stuff like that. So we're a little more than halfway to having uh, our outdoor lighting taken care of and our, uh, our, our our fountains and pumps and stuff like that running off of solar with a battery backup. So yay. Hmm. Let's see. This new mouse, it's got a little button on the side, and for some reason, whenever I, um, whenever I hit it, it, uh, it does weird things. So David is saying, night gardening? Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, I should be, I should be, yeah, I should be doing some, some, uh, how to put together a solar, a, a, a basic and simple 12 volt solar system, uh, because, you know, a lot of people are getting in, in, into buying, Things for for solar for backup that's going to run the the AC for their houses and you don't really need to have a, an inverter and trying to run your household off of solar. You can use 12 volt DC and accomplish a whole heck of a lot without wasting power converting it from 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 DC current to AC current. Uh, at the end of the day, I mean the LED light bulbs that we have in the house run off of DC. They're just They've got a diode in them that, that converts the AC to DC so they can run. Like, why don't I just use DC power for my lighting in the first place? John saying 14 gauge wire is better. Yeah, it is, but <sighs> I was able to find 16. <laughs> just as long as I'm not running more than as long as I'm not running more than like 500 watts through it at any given time, the the, the, the 16 gauge wire will be fine. But keep in mind, I'm not trying to run a house off of it. I'm just trying to run a few pumps and a few lights. All right. Let's see. Vicky was saying, one pro this is very true. One problem with solar is it doesn't produce power 24-7. Um, it doesn't produce power 24-7. Of course, that's why we have batteries. But, of course, batteries have have, have a, a limited life. Eventually, they will they will stop charging, and you'll have to replace the battery, right? And that's one of the reasons why I've got the other project that we're working on. And hopefully, um, hopefully I'll be able to to demonstrate that here pretty soon. I need to have a functioning DC uh, power system before I can start introducing the new element, which would be the uh, the thermal. That's going to be fun. All right. Well, it, it, it basically it allow me to do things whether the grid's functioning or not, like you know, making sure that my fish stay, stay, uh, stay happy and aerated, and uh, keeping some some external lights on to to keep the creepy crawlers at bay, and things like that. Mary <laughs> says I can open other boxes too. Uh, the other boxes are already open, man. They are already open. We open them. You. Open did I open them or did you open them? Oh, I opened them. I opened them earlier. Um, this is what Mary got for herself. She's got this thing. It's a little um, it's a little refrigerator. 12 volt refrigerator runs off of off of your uh, your vehicle, your vehicle battery. So it's got a little tiny box where she can put her, her sandwich stuff and stuff like that. And I'm assuming that uh, but these little, I don't know. I don't know if these keep your drinks cold or not, but this got a little cup holder and everything. I think it's supposed to go like right down in the middle of a, a center console or something like that. Kind of cool, kind of cool. Because if, if you're out there on the road like Mary is and you're driving a truck and you're having to, to get your meals when, when you can get them, um, a lot of the food that's available out there is just junk. So having access to to, to fresh good food as a, as an alternative to the, the the crud that they serve up at truck stops um, should help your health out considerably. Vicky is saying right now I'm getting my property timbered and intend to use the funds for a bulldozer. All right, 
I will need help getting the microhydro system designed set up. It won't hurt fish. Well, that's cool. Um, there's some ways of doing it. Just really depends upon what you've got. Uh, let's see. Blake saying, I want to make an outdoor deep water hydroponic system looking for a good air pump that will hold up outside. Well, me too. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be buying a whole bunch of them. I'm going to be trying out a whole bunch of them. And whenever I find one that's, that's actually worth the money, I'll let you guys know. Because it's um, actually if I find one that's worth the money, I'll probably order up a, a pallet of them and then just put them up for sale and you can buy them for me. Capitalism. <laughs> John says, motors and heat and AC, they're a main load from electrical current. Oh, yeah. Big time. Hmm. Let me see here. Mary's talking about our future project, Greenhouse. Um. We want to have we want to have it half buried actually. MK Church is asking if it's okay to ask a random question. Of course, it's okay to ask random questions. I love random questions. Have I ever used diluted D I L U T E D? But anyway, you're using talk to type, aren't you? Uh, for watering your plants to increase its calcium, I have not. I have not, but using a using sour milk as a uh, as a means of feeding your soil is not a bad idea. Hmm. Put that out there where the bacteria can get it, and um, I'm sure it wouldn't hurt calcium either. <laughs> John says crush Thomas for calcium. Now you can crush Thomas, you can add uh you can add uh gypsum, um add uh dolomitic lime and a few different ways of getting calcium in. All right, so I showed you the new toys. Yep, 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 showed you the new toys. Uh, let's see. This is time to plug a book. This is not the one I want you guys to go out and buy. Hang on a second. Let me turn off my green screen real quick. This is not the one I want you to go out and buy. I mean, can, you can. You can go out and buy this one if you want to. But there's a, there's a new edition out, and I should have... Um, I should have uh, paid more attention whenever I placed my order on Amazon. Okay, so this is, this is the Create Your Own Florida Food Forest by... Oh, David the Good. Okay, this is the first edition, right? The second edition is much better. All right, so this one just has the bare bones of the thing. And um, I wasn't paying attention. I, I ordered it up, said, okay, I'm going to go look through and see the way he, he laid his out. And that way we'll have a little bit of continuity, right? So they're both going to be coming out of, out of good books. And... No, go go through the the, the layout. He's, he's saying a whole lot of the same stuff that I would be saying. So there's there's not really going to be a whole lot of difference there. Where it mainly is going to get different is um, the specific uh, plants and trees that we're going to be putting into the different systems. And in the in the beginning, when I would start talking about uh, about what is a food force and why you want one, I might come up with a with a different a different reason for why you want to have a food forest just to make things interesting vicky says i have heard that diluted milk can be used as a foliage foli a foliar a foliar spray for various purposes i haven't looked into it yet i mean i've heard the same thing uh, i i've i've never I've never felt the need to 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 get milk specifically for that purpose, and uh, I, whenever I've got milk, I have a tendency to drink it all before it spoils. So, <clears throat> we uh, we're sneaky around here. 
we like to get the um, that that one quart shelf stable milk from the buck and a quarter store. So we've got a couple months of milk stored up on the shelves, and then we just take a quart out and put it in the fridge and rotate it whenever we need fresh milk. John says, "Dang, cabbage caterpillars are killing my cabbage and kale." Mm. Need some wasps and some birds. You can also, if you if you're if you have a wasp and bird deficiency and you don't have time to wait for the wasps and the birds to to realize that your your, your garden is a good place to be, you can get some uh, get some leaves from your uh, from your elderberry elderberry bushes. I was going to say elderberry tree, elderberry, elderberry bushes, and. Uh, and make a, a decoction, chop them up, throw them in boiling water, and then let them steep in the boiling water for 15, 20 minutes or so. Strain it off and then spray that on. And that should be useful not only for helping with uh, with powdery mildew, but also for chasing away unwanted buggies. Of course, you can use BT as well. I think I'd rather use elderberry than uh, than uh, the than the tobacco leaves that we've got over there. <laughs> what about a mulberry tree? I'm trying to keep the squirrels. I don't know. I don't think it's gonna. I don't think. I don't think it'll hurt the squirrels. I think that if they if they get a taste of it, they might. Well, I don't like that, and 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 leave your your mulberries alone. It'd be worth a try. Squirrels don't like bitter stuff. Oh, tobacco. I don't know. You might wind up with addicted squirrels. You see them just hopping in their, hopping into their cars and rolling down the street with the shades on. Keeping the squirrels out. Yeah, that'll work. Um, if you can make it bitter, if you, if you can find a way to make it bitter, the squirrels won't eat it. Um, this is the reason why they, they don't eat safflower. If you have safflower in your, in your, uh, in your, in your bird feeders, it helps keep them out of there. Let's see. Heterodox says, got Eric Tonsmeyer's, I hope it says his name right, book on perennials. Didn't know there were so many. Didn't know there were so many perennials. Didn't know there were so many books. <laughs> Either way, it's, yeah, there's a there, there are so many wonderful plants and trees and shrubs. Oh my gosh! Okay, so when I, when I was making this list, when I was making the list, I, I was going through everything, and I, I literally had to just say, okay, we're, we're, I'm, I'm going to stop it here. I've got 33 entries. That's enough to fill up the entire page, and then we'll do a write up on each one of those after that. So each one of us going to get their their own page afterwards, or maybe a half a page. I don't, I don't know. We'll see how we we'll see how we format it and how much how much talking I need to do on each one. Essentially, what I'm going to do for each entry is, is give you a sales pitch on why you want this tree, right? So we'll talk a little bit about how, how, how easy it is to propagate, how good the food coming out of it is, how much you can expect to get from it, what other benefits it has, things like that. And that only might be, you know, one paragraph. So we might have a paragraph and a picture and a paragraph and a picture. So we have maybe have two per page. Uh, we'll just, we'll have to see whenever we get to that point. Um, Vicky's saying, John, I have heard that mulberries are used as a trap crop to keep the squirrels away from more valuable crops. Squirrels love mulberries. It, and if you, if you want to capture squirrels, if you want to attract squirrels, grow some mulberries. Squirrels is good eating. So having some squirrels around is, is definitely worth it. All right. I'm going to share something with you guys since you guys are, have, have hung on for this long. This is the first thing I sent into the publisher. And uh, so this would be considered maybe a spoiler. I just finished um, my first write-up of the, the canopy trees that are going into the into the book. 
I finished the first write up and I realized that I was going to have to say something about about Jugwa, which is the the toxic substance that uh, that walnuts secrete from their roots. And it's actually in all parts of the walnut, but they secrete it from the roots, which causes problems for things in the immediate vicinity. Um, Vicky's asking if I can make a list of all ceram plants. I might, yeah, I might include. Here's some. Here's some other good plants that that I didn't do a full write up on. Yeah, I, I could probably do that. We'll see. As long as the book isn't too incredibly monstrous by that time, it's already looking like it might get uh, kind of big. All right, so I, I decided, okay, we're going to put in a little appendix here right behind canopies. We'll pull an asterisk that says "See Appendix One," and then we'll put that in right after that, so you can you, you can get the the skinny on juglone and what it means to have a, a black walnut or or something similar in your in your landscape. Some people might be turned off from the idea of getting one simply because they're worried that they're not going to be able to find things that are compatible. So let me go ahead and share this with you real quick. Uh oh. What happened to my share? Oh no. It got canceled. Ah, that's right. Okay. All right, here we go. Okay, here we go. Appendix one, a word on juglone. The life of the force is not limited to the above ground portion that we routinely see. Just below the surface is an entire world of activity called the rhizosphere, or root zone. The rhizosphere is filled with fungi and bacteria, microscopic protozoa, nematodes, worms, insects, and some larger animals all going about their lives, surrounded by the roots of the plants and trees above. Just like in a human community, there are symbiotic and cooperative relationships in the rhizosphere, but there's competition as well, and sometimes warfare. Now, before I go on, I should mention that I will probably put that paragraph in another spot. It's not, it's not going to go in the appendix. So you'll have already read this before you get to appendix one. So th this part will be, will be edited out in, in the final version. Although many plant species engage in chemical warfare with each other and with potential pests, the most notorious perpetrators of plant-on-plant -plant violence are members of the family Juglandacea, the walnuts. All members of the walnut family secrete a toxic substance called juglone from their roots, which is capable of killing transplanted trees and inhibiting the germination of seeds. Black walnut trees, the juglans nigra, various species, is, if you see SPP with a period behind it, it means various species, various, various subspecies or cultivars. Now you know. It's by far the worst offender, so much so that with only a few conditional exceptions, most other members of the family are capable of peaceful coexistence and less environmental stress causes them to crank up the juglone production. So if they're, if they're suffering from insufficient water or they're having a hard time getting enough uh, nutrients that they need, then they may respond to that stress by increasing their production of juglone and getting rid of the competition. So you have to be aware of that if you've got relatives of, 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 the, of the black walnut, but black walnut and to a certain extent, butternut too, are, are the, are the biggest offenders. And I, I don't even mention butternut. I guess I probably should, but uh, it'll, that probably will be in the, in the also ran category, Vicki. All right. The symptoms of juglone poisoning mimic dehydration, wilting and yellowing of the leaves of affected plants and potentially death. These symptoms have been observed in conjunction with black walnuts for a long time. As a matter of fact, I think it was Pliny the Elder uh, mentioned that in the shadow of, of, of the walnut tree, other trees are, are, are affected. Of course, it wasn't the shadow of the walnut tree that affected them. It was the, it was the, 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 the toxin juglone. But that was not identified. Uh, the toxin itself was, has been identified since the middle 1800s. It's like 1851 or somewhere around there. Uh, juglone is subjected is subject to decomposition in an aerobic environment and will be rendered harmless within four months. I mean, some people say six, but usually, yeah, about four is enough. So if you're using a horticultural compost or mulch containing members of the Juglandacea family, allow it to properly age before using it in a seed bed or around young transplants. Some plants are more susceptible than others, so exercise extra caution with these. And before I go on, I should mention, if you're going and getting your, 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 um, your mulch from, say, a, a municipal green waste disposal site, usually 
that stuff has been sitting around for at least six months before you ever got it loaded up and took it home. So even if they have black walnut in it, it's not going to hurt you. But if it's fresh, then um, then 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 you might want to just not put it out there on your seed bed or around something that you've just transplanted. And you can always you can always ask them to uh, to load up the the oldest stuff that they've got as well. All right, so plants that are particularly susceptible are apples. All the apples, all the malice are, are are susceptible. Asparagus, brassicas, that includes cabbage, mustard, bok choy, stuff like that. Chrysanthemums. There are some that, that that seem to be resistant, but for the most part, chrysanthemums are, are are susceptible. So, even tansy, tanacetum, stuff like that would would wind up having an issue. Uh, columbines, hydrangeas, narcissus, peonies, pinaceae trees and shrubs like fir, larch, pine, spruce, and all of the true cedars. Not not the uh, not the junipers, but true cedars are affected. Uh, so, if, for example, eastern and western red cedar. Those are actually junipers, not true cedars. And those are not affected. Uh, rhubarb and solanaceous plants, eggplant, peppers, potatoes, tomatoes, and true lilies. Of course, true lilies are not edible. True lilies, lilies are poisonous. But you might, for some reason, want to have a true lily around just because you, you happen to like the flower. All right. So please note that just because these plants are more susceptible, it does not mean that you cannot successfully interplant them with members of the Juglandaceae family. I have several examples from this list growing quite happily in the shade of our pecan tree without issue so far. So there we go. And we'll stop sharing that and exit this full screen and come back over here. And there we go. So that's uh, that's just a, a an example of the stuff that's going to be in the book. We're going to give you a little a little taste of it. Um, so if, if you were worried about having a or having a walnut some kind of walnut in your in your food forest. Don't be. You can find plenty of things that are going to going to cooperate along with it. I mean, some of them actually just, they're not going to care at all. I mean, most of your peaches, most of your prunus, they're not going to care. Um, Heterocyst black chokeberries, cedars, bamboo, and pawpaws. Yeah, guardian preppers in the house. Hello, hello. Uh, let's see here. Talking about squirrels, hickory trees are their favorite. More squirrels you get, the more nuts you get. Yeah, the squirrel, the squirrel and the nut go go hand in hand. Um, I keep on saying that, that 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 people need to look at the squirrel for inspiration because this is what the squirrel does. He finds uh, he finds a, a fruit or a nut that he likes, and he goes and he gathers them together and and stashes them away. And this is how successful trees get propagated by producing food that the squirrel likes. Well, I mean, the same thing works for humans. It's just we're capable of crossing continents. Squirrels might be able to cross a river. <laughs> Green persimmon or ale? Yeah, yeah. Unripened persimmon fruit would definitely uh, would definitely qualify. John's heading off to bed. Good night, John. It's not a bad idea. Oh my goodness. So anyway, um, we're going to be, okay, so one of the things I'm going to add to this list, and I haven't put it in yet, uh, I'm going to have to go back and do it. Uh, what I've already got down is is whether whether a, a plant is monoecious, dioecious, or or hermaphroditic, whether or not it's self-fertile, and then, of course, whether, whether it's there for being edible, there for being a nitrogen fixer, there for being a pollinator. All that information is in, in the key uh, for each entry so far. I need to go back and add the bloom time. So if a, if a plant is being is, is, has a little P next to it in the, in the legend, that indicates that it's it's a, a good for attracting pollinators. And then I'll add in a number uh, range like one to two, two to four, three to six, whatever it is, whatever the months of the year are that it's in bloom. So one, of course, is January in the northern hemisphere. It's going to be based off the norm, northern hemisphere. So if you're in the southern hemisphere and are using the book, then just reverse it and and there you go um so if it's if it's going to be in bloom say from march through april well that'll be three to four right so i'll say p3-4 that way you know it's in bloom from march to april and that way if you're 
if you're trying to make sure that you've got something in bloom at all different times of the year so that well, at least the, the things are in bloom so you have something for your pollinators to, to 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 get food from you can look at the key while you're looking at the list and go okay that's something that i can use for this purpose i'm going to put it in now instead of having to just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth trying to fill all the niches that you need you can start from the top work your way down and put in the things that you want as you go along hopefully hopefully it'll be a fairly painless process to design a food course this way vicky says squirrels never store bad nuts that's right uh let's see blake is asking am i going to include a list of fruit trees that are capable of grafting hmm it's a good question um uh, try to make a middle note. I should probably add a little segment on that. Um, it's not a bad idea. So most of your stone fruits can be grafted on other stone fruits. Um, most of your pyrus can graft on other pyrus. Malice can graft on other malice. And there are some cases where you can cross graft a few different things. Um, for example, I love peaches. Peaches are a wonderful, a wonderful fruit. Peach trees, on the other hand, have it tends to be really weak and susceptible, susceptible to damage, and they don't live very long. So instead of instead of growing a whole bunch of peach trees, you might want to consider growing one peach tree, and then get your grafting material, your science from that one peach tree while it's still relatively young, and then graft that onto your other stone fruits that you've got around the property. So for example, right now we've got uh, we've got uh, two sweet cherries. No, I'm a liar. We've got one sweet cherry, one sour cherry. Those are both prunus. Those are both take a graft from, from a peach tree. We've got um, two plum trees. Those are both take a graft from a peach tree. So I've got four different, I've got four different other members of the prunus genus scattered around in various places on this one third acre that I can cross graft a peach tree limb onto. So I can have I can have peaches growing in, in five different locations. One of them is that will actually be a peach tree. And so I can have um, <laughs> so I can have lots and lots of peaches, which I absolutely love, and not have to worry about being stuck with having to depend upon that peach tree surviving year after year. If it winds up getting killed, it'll get killed, and I'll replace it with something else. Alan says, did I read the wrong book for book club again? <laughs> oh, hello, Joe. Live better late than never, he says. Oh. Did I mention? Uh, oh, I didn't. Oh, my goodness. I'm such a horrible host. Guys, there was another page. There was another page to that to that little bit on Jugwone. I'm horrible. Let me... Uh, you just jump right back over there. No, not you. Yeah. Share screen. There we go. See, this is what I get for not paying attention. Okay, there we are. We'll come over here and we're going to go view. Full screen. Okay. I forgot I had a second page. At the opposite end of the spectrum, I was like, wait a minute. I didn't mention these things because I was going to. At the opposite end of the spectrum, there are many plants that can tolerate growing in close proximity to a black walnut without suffering from juggalone poisoning. So that would be your alliums, garlic, leeks, onions, ramps, shallots. So back east in Appalachia, you can find ramps growing underneath black walnuts all day long, and they're happy. Apricots, asters, all members of the Asteraceae family are, 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 are as far as I know, immune to juggalone. Beans, I know it's an annual, but beans. Bee balm, the Stira Monardas, Bellflower, the Campanulas, those are all, all immune. Cherries, and I, I should probably just go ahead and, and state that all of your stone fruits are, are immune from juggalone poisoning. Uh, clover, your corn, that's ZMAs, of course. Crocuses, if you're interested in growing saffron. Currants, daylilies, dogwoods, elderberries, ferns, hawthorns, hazelnuts, hibiscus, hollies, all members of the Ilex genus, since all hollies are, are, are immune. Ostas. Uh, Ipomias, that's sweet potatoes, of course. Junipers, that's eastern red cedar. Maples, except silver maple for some reason. I don't know why. 
uh, all of your, your Quercus, all the oaks are, pawpaws, peaches, pears, persimmons, plums, the redbud, of course, sassafras, Saskatoon, service berries, spice bush, spider warts, all the curcubits, shumix, and yarrow, all of those. The list is you know, far from complete, but as you can see, there are enough compatible species. There is no need to exclude black walnut trees from consideration in your food forest. If you love black walnut, then by all means, go for it. It's not going to hurt a thing. You'll be able to find plenty of stuff to, to, to plant along with it. All right, so that's the spoilers. <laughs> Give you a little, a little sample of what's in the book. And, of course, there's more and more other stuff that's going in there, too. So, um, we'll be putting in mycorrhizal associations as well. So if you want to get into geeky, in-depth detail about what sort of things are going to be happening in the rhizosphere and, and, and trying to, to, to link your your trees and shrubs and plants together in, in mutual mutual networks, uh, that information will be in there as well. All right. Let's see. Blake says, got our first two fruit trees, lemon and fig. Ficus carica. Hmm. Zone six through nine. Or is it six through 10? Maybe six through 10. Maybe even a little bit further. Depending. Peter Dutch says, I didn't realize Eastern, Eastern Red Cedar is a juniper. Yeah, it's a juniper. That's why it has those little berries on it. They have little, little juniper berries. It's a juniper. I know, right? Been lied to all this time. I always thought it was a. <laughs> yep, it's a juniper. Uh, the book's name is going to be. Create your own temperate food forest or create your own temperate climate food forest. It just, it's going to be one of one, one or the other of those. We don't know exactly which yet. Uh, David pitched temperate climate, and I'm thinking temperate, but you know, either works for me. Vicky's saying, would it be too late to plant pawpaw seeds? I don't know. I believe you probably want to start them in a cold frame um, and let them stratify, don't you? If I'm if I'm remembering correctly, um, if you do plant them now, if they're already stratified and you plant them now, would they germinate? Maybe. Uh, Mm -hmm. You could try it. Just don't plant them all. <laughs> that way, if they don't make it, you've got spares and you can, you can plant them again later. Or you have to baby the baby your little seedlings, too. Pawpaws are tricky because of those taproots. The taproots are just really long, really deep, and if you disturb them, it, it the tree doesn't re usually recover from it very well. David is asking if I've ever messed with true potato seed. I have not. I very rarely ever see true potato seed. I mean, very, very something. Uh, occasionally, I let one go to the point where it's it's flowered and it's produced. But, uh, but no, I've I've never tried planting true potato seeds. I suppose I could try one of these days. But you know, Oklahoma is not a great place to be trying to grow potatoes because of the the way our weather patterns work. We go from. We go from, from from freezing at the end of winter to maybe about 30 days of, of, of that nice, cool growing season that, that potatoes like. And then before June hits, we're already into the 80s and, and they're they're pretty much done. Vicky says they've been stratified, mislaid them in the fridge, and just found them again. As long as you can as, as long as you can. Hmm. All right. If I was going to do it, if, if I was going to do it, I would get a very, very, very deep container. I mean, deep. Um, and start them in a container. And then come springtime, just about the time that everything comes up, is, is ready to break dormancy, move them outside. Or, hmm. I don't know. I'd be leery about doing it. No, in actuality. Just, I would much rather plant them where they're going to grow. 
so that they don't uh, they don't suffer from the shock of being moved around. But that's just me. David says, I actually got some seed from cultivatable website, got several trays of sprouts coming up, and I'm hoping to breed my own. That's cool. I have eat. What? I got my own potato variety here. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And the most potatoes out there are, are uh, just variations of the same thing. Having something with specific genetics that you can point to and go, that's mine. That's cool. Anywho, guys. Um, I'm going to turn the AC on here in just a minute because I'm, I'm burning up. If you guys have got any questions, comments, complaints, um, wanted to hear more about how much I hate Robinia pseudoacacia. <laughs> The bees love it. It's a great tree for bees. And, of course, it's a nitrogen fixer. And uh, if, if you want to build a, a nice thorny hedge to keep intruders out, it's, it's great for that, too. He says, thanks for the videos. Well, you're welcome. I'll keep on making them. Oh, hey, speaking of, the next one I do. What do you guys want to see? I've, I've got a couple options. I haven't I haven't actually started shooting it yet. Well, I've got some things that I've shot, but I have I haven't I haven't decided what's coming up on Sunday yet. Here's a couple things that I've, that I've been bouncing around. Um, I could work on the first stage of a thermoelectric generator, solar thermoelectric generator. So we're using TEGs and making making the solar bit because I've got the batteries now and I've got a charge controller, a spare charge controller, so I could do that. And this, this one will be just like wiring them up in series, painting the hot side black, in, you know, putting them in, into some insulated material so that the, the heat sinks are on the back and I can blow air across it to, to cool it off or maybe circulate water across the back side, one of the, one of the other ways. I could do that. I could also, there's a, a little building project that I want to do, uh, making wind chimes. Do-it-yourself wind chimes because, you know, Having wind chimes in the garden is cool. If you've got a good enough wind chime, whenever you're inside, you can hear it and know if it's if it's windy out without even having to go out there and look out the window. I kind of like that. I want to build something where I can tell if it's raining or not, too. So it'd be something like a, a, a symbol that's set off by the rain hitting it. So a little indicator that tells me if it's raining, tells me if it's windy, that sort of thing. But anyway, wind chimes. Um, I want to do some, some DIY wind chimes using as inexpensive materials as possible. Well, one and a half inch uh, line post. It's fairly cheap. It's like twelve bucks for six feet. Um, what's what's the other thing that we can do? Uh, I might talk a bit about ducks and using ducks and duck water fertilization and that sort of thing. There's more of that 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 livestock integration. Uh, I could probably do a bit on starting goji berry and mulberry from cuttings. I've started a few mulberries earlier because they're done fruiting now and now that they're not trying to put their energy into making fruit i can probably try to get them to make some roots maybe i mean we'll try they're they're they're, they're all they're uh morris ruber which are kind of hard to root anyway but yeah I'll give it a shot um so wind chimes huh david says wind chimes all right. Wind time sounds good. Uh, I could also do some more I know, some more stuff with solar panels. We could, we, could, we could show you that stuff, too. Sassafras Red's finally in the house. Hello. Yeah, we're, just as I'm getting ready to sign off. <laughs> David's saying, what kind of ducks must be? No, these guys are uh, these guys are khaki camels. They're a khaki camel. They're uh, kind of a cross between uh, mallards and Indian runner ducks. So they're um, they're uh, really, really good layers, but they're very skittish. I mean, these guys are super skittish. Oh, the other thing that I could do is um, you guys have been following the the weather patterns here, right? It's, it's been kind of freaky. There's so many places that are getting getting stiffed for rain. Uh, I was watching Danny and Wanda, you know, deep south Homestead, not too long ago, and Danny was talking about just 
how his corn's getting beat down. He's been 10, 12 days, no rain. Well, shoot, we've been about three weeks with no rain out here. And he's been watering and watering and watering. It's just it's not seeming to help. Everything's getting just beat out there. And his corn's dying off. It's not making any ears. And the thought occurs to me that uh, I haven't watered my corn yet. I haven't watered it at all. The only thing that, that's had going for it is the um, is the thing that I did right towards the end of the winter that I did the video on the title of Water for Every Garden. That's all I did. And then everything else has just been the rain that it's got. And then I've been banking the rain in the I've been banking the rain in the in those in those trenches that I filled up with wood chips. So what I'm thinking about doing is getting out there and um, maybe digging down into one of those trenches and finding out how much moisture is still being held in there, even though we haven't had rain for about three weeks now. Uh, but there's there's some other things I've got going. I planted I planted a, a, a ground cover in the form of clover around the corn. Lots of organic matter in the soil to begin with. And of course, those trenches filled up with wood chips in the walkways after the heavy rains that we got. Hopefully that's still banking moisture. So um, I haven't watered and the corn's doing fine. It's putting on ears. Some of them has got two ears per plant. Uh, they're, they're doing great. I need to get out there and uh, and bop them with a with a pool noodle or something this maybe this morning or the next morning to make sure all the all the silks get nice and pollen dusted because it hasn't been very windy. Uh, so I need to just go out there and give them a good whacking, <laughs> make sure everything gets pollinated right. But maybe I should get out there and, and dig down there and show you guys what that that looks like three weeks in with no rain and. Uh, and, and, and show that. <laughs> Vicky says they're, they're plagued with fire ants. And they cannot mulch. They got fire ants either way. They may as well mulch. <laughs> they may as well mulch and get some ducks or something or frogs. Yeah, get a whole frog pond. Some dart frogs in it. Can you imagine how toxic a frog's skin would be if it had been running around eating nothing but fire ants? Whoo. Still no ears, huh? I was beginning to get worried because it's 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 getting up to that height and it hadn't started now. The tassels were coming up and I didn't see any ears, but they're coming on now. They're coming on, and like I said, it's 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 looking like you know two ears per plant. And this this stuff, okay, the big horse spotted corn is it's it's a little bit odd. It'll produce one big long ear and then it produces one short ear. And that's just the way it does it. It has one long, one short. And and usually it's it's two per plant that, that wind up producing anyway. They don't always all wind up producing. It's, I'm hoping that uh, I can fix that problem in genetics by, by selective breeding it. But whenever I'm done doing that, I'm going to wind up with um, I'm going to wind up with uh, with white eagle corn. I'll just breed white eagle back out of it again. We have big horse and blue hoopy both planted this year. Give them a little bit of time. Uh, give me a little bit of time. If you if, if if you're if you're a week or two behind, and I know you're a little bit further up north too, so you might be you might be mid July before you start getting ears. But you should get ears. Should keep the fingers crossed. Hundreds, hundreds of frogs earlier. Now way fewer. We still have a bunch of, of little frogs running around all over the place. Yes, yes, I do. I, I've got. Uh, I have three sets. We have three sets. Uh, three blocks, basically. Three blocks. Uh, four rows per block. Um, and that's you know one foot spacing between the rows, and I've got. Uh, I've got eight inches between plants. Actually, I got six inches between plants because I didn't thin them as much as I should have. That's okay. I'll just uh, keep on pouring the fertilizer on there. By fertilizer, I mean um, fetid swamp water and duck poo. <laughs> they seem to like duck poo, and that may that this okay. So that, I guess that would count as a little bit of watering because you know it it is in a liquid form, but. Uh, 
But yeah, that's what is that? 16. Well, hang on. 40, 160, 160 times three would be like 500 some odd. Yeah, we, we, we get, yeah, we have, we have enough to prevent, prevent a uh, embryo depression. Vicky says, see the sweet corn variety called six shooter because it's supposed to be able to grow that many ears per stock. Well, it's supposed to be and did. Now that's two different, two different things. <laughs> David said, "How do you mainly consume the corn?" Uh, well, this is going to be this is going to be a new one for me. This past year, um, this past year, I just grew for seed because I, I, I was trying to get you know, land raised seed that wants to grow here in northeastern Oklahoma, and this was the first year that that I was growing the big horse. And then this year, I selected the seed that I wanted to plant out of that, and I planted just the seed that I had selected. So this trying to to, to, to to isolate certain genetics and, and get them properly adapted for here. So this should be a, a much better year for production. And I might actually eat some of it. But the way we're planning on eating it is um, nixtamalization. And I did a little bit of a trial nixtamalization with just regular field corn uh, last year, with just that yellow field corn uh, using using Mexicali lime, uh, cow. This year we're going to try it with uh, with wood ash from the wood stove since we actually did use the wood stove this year. So uh, we'll we'll we'll, we'll nixtamalize the the corn after it dries, and then I've got oh shoot where did I have that thing? It's behind the green screen. Let me grab it. Wait. Oh, there it is. Hi, Kitty. Where are you up to? Got the kitty hiding behind the green screen too. All right, so we've got this this little puppy here. This is a Victoria cast iron grain mill. So after we do the nix, we'll run it through this, grind it, and then put it on screen, let it dry, and then we'll um, we'll we'll grind it a second time after it's dried, and that will get us our uh, our masa. And then uh, I think I showed off the, the the tortilla press last week. I think it was last week I showed you guys the tortilla press. I've been practicing making uh, corn tortillas for for the past uh, week or so, and I finally got to the point where I can make them where they're nice and they're flexible and they don't crack whenever you fold them. And they're 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 they're, they're oh so 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 very good. I mean, fresh homemade tortillas are they're just yummy. A volcanic Mexican metate. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. It's also a lot of work. <laughs> but, uh, heck yeah. Like down in the Southwest, there are some other ways that you can make it too. Um, having a Having a, a flat stone on your hearth with the coals underneath, and you just mix up the the, the, the ground corn with the wood ash and and the other stuff, and they, they would smear that on the surface of the stone and let that cook, and it makes like a paper thin bread that you can just peel off and eat. But it, all, it comes out great because it's got the ashes still in it. It's like mm, I don't know, <laughs> I don't think I want to eat that. <laughs> but uh, well, that was a that was another traditional southwestern way of way of doing it. But I, I, I think I like the corn tortillas better. Yeah, it definitely it's 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 definitely an art. Okay, so for the for the for the first I don't know three or four batches that I made, I was just having the hardest time getting the consistency right. So I'd, I'd have the right amount of water. I had the right amount of salt. I had the right amount of masa. I mix it all up. I let it rest for ten minutes, and and then it would be too tacky. And I'd have to add more masa so, so it wouldn't be tacky. And then it wind up being too dry, and it it wind up cracking whenever I whenever I, I try to make it. Um, kneeling down bread, yeah, Joe, that's what it was. Yeah. Yep. Kneeling down bread. 
And I think there was a uh, uh, with Dene Navajo, yeah. Yeah. Well well Dene is also uh is also Apache. So there you go. Anyway. So yeah, the first first batch is it was it was either it was either too 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 wet, too dry, cracked whenever when, whenever I was trying to make it, or I, I tried mixing in a little bit of lard with it to to, to 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 smooth it out. And that seemed to work okay, but it would still crack whenever you whenever you uh tried to roll the tortilla all together. And then I figured out what it was that I was doing wrong. That's what I was doing wrong. You're supposed to knead it for about three to five minutes. And I was not doing that. I wasn't doing that kneading. But to flatten it, flatten it out to a nice big flat. And then fold it over, fold it over again. Roll it up in the ball, flatten it out again. Flip it, flip it, roll it into a ball and just keep on working it like that. Three to five minutes. And then at that point, as long as it's not, as long as you've, you've made sure that it's not tacky anymore, then you get that nice, springy texture whenever it's got the nice springy texture then you can make tortillas that won't crack and it's it's all it's all in the in in the kneading process i had just been making it kind of like i'd make a biscuit dough right where you mix it to the point where it makes a nice uniform dough and i thought that was good no it's not you have to keep on working it you have to keep working it Heterodox is asking is polenta is hard to make. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think that's 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 where you take corn and you grind it up and boil it to make a mush and then it congeals into the into the polenta. But of course the problem with polenta is it's it hasn't been nixtamalized, so it's not been pre-digested with that uh, with that alkaline solution. So yeah. Roll these for the tortilla. Uh, let me clean up the kitchen a little bit because it's still a mess in there. But yeah, definitely. I, I'm I'm thinking about doing it in two stages, either um, you know one stage where I make the tortillas and another stage when I'm when I, whenever I, I do the nixtamalization. Um, I really want to do it all the way from from start to finish with like you know I'll, I'll harvest the corn. And I've got some I've already dried. I have some that's already dried in, so I've, I don't have to wait until it's dried in. I'll come in, I'll harvest it. Go, well, this is what we got this year, and then I'll take some of the last year's and I'll nixtamalize that at that point, and then make the make the masa. It might be you know, a month long process from the time that I, I get started grinding it to the time that we actually make it, unless I uh, unless I do it with 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 uh, fresh wet masa, you know. The thing of doing it with, with with grinding it wet is you have to take some of that moisture out, and the only way that's really effective for doing it is to add additional dry masa harina to it. So you add a little extra from wherever you've got it. So I might you know I might have to take some of the stuff that's store bought and add it to to do it if I was going to be making it from freshly ground wet. So I don't know. We'll see. The Oaxan, am I pronouncing that right? Tamales, tamales, which are made in banana leaves are too doughy. I like the tamales made with corn husk leaves. And think about that. Uh, probably going to be experimenting a little bit with using uh, using canna leaves for cooking too. It's going to be fun. Yeah, that, that's what it is. It's cornmeal mush. There's it's it hasn't been nixtamalized. It's just ground corn. But uh, Tespera says it's getting it right is a lot of stirring. Yeah, I imagine you get your, your your moisture content right. You cook it the right amount of time. You want it to basically you're making like a corn a congealed corn pudding. Is what what polenta is. Spicy peppers. I am still using. I am still using cayenne peppers from two years ago. For cooking with Tasperus and banana leaf would be wetter, so I think it would make it doughy. Yeah. Probably. I mean, that's one of the advantages of using a, a banana leaf to cook with. You get your 
you get your, your 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 fish or whatever it is, and you wrap the leaf around it, and make a little packet, and maybe put a little bit of salt on the top, on on the top over the top of the banana leaf, right? And then you cover that up with with the coals, and then you bury that and let it sit there, and go off and do your thing that you're going to do, and you come back and you dig it out, and everything's cooked. That's uh, it's more like a Hawaiian style cooking, Polynesian style cooking using banana leaf. I just thought it would be kind of cool to use Canada the same way and see if it works. A cayenne pepper plant has been growing for three years now. Wow. The one that I, that I kept over winter, I wound, I wound up managing to kill it. <laughs> it made some peppers, but, but then I killed it. Uh, I, I, let, I let it stay outside and forgot to water it. And, you know, the rain didn't fall. I have not. David's asking if I grow any figs in my region in Oklahoma. Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Uh, I tried Chicago Hardy, and they died down to the roots because we get these, these sub-zero winters periodically. And it's not every winter that we get, you know, minus five, but sometimes it happens. Like every three or four years, we'll have a really bad, harsh winter. Um and who was it? Lisa Kukla, one of the one of the other viewers, uh, had encountered one uh, fig tree that the, the the a lady she knew wanted to get rid of it. She's like, I keep on trying to kill this fig tree. Nothing I'll do will kill this fig tree. Can you get this fig tree out of here? And, and she she had been you know, doing doing work in exchange for a place to camp her trailer. Um, and so she told me about this fig tree that just wouldn't die. I was like. It, was it is it does it have southern exposure is it like right up against the building or something so there, there's there's a little little uh zone push going on there she says oh it's out in the middle of the open there's nothing around it like, that's weird um <laughs> what else is going on there is there some is there a body of water right next to it that maybe that, that's that's a uh, that's a, a reservoir of, of, of heat there that's maybe 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 pushing the zone for it to keeping it you know I said no there's nothing like that it's just it's out in the middle of middle middle of the yard there's nothing around it and it just doesn't die. I went, okay, um, bring me some. And so she brought some, and I've got it planted around now. And sure enough, this winter it did not die down to the roots like the uh, like the other figs that we have do. So we, the, the 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 Chicago hardy fig it'll grow back from the roots every year, and as long as we have enough uh, enough heat and enough moisture during the course of the year, it'll it'll make figs too. It's just whenever winter comes, it dies, and then it'll, it'll have to grow back from the roots again. But this one. It's kept it's kept living wood on it, so um, we'll see. Yeah, and yeah, it's this that um, it's, it's, it's that hey, around February we wake up and find Hay River on on, on our front porch. It's like, oh wow, well, we're in the middle of the plains here. There's nothing to stop it. Just jet stream dips and that's it. So we're zone seven A, but uh, occasionally we're zone three. <laughs> For at least a couple of days, and if something is going to be killed off by by freezing weather for a couple of days, then that's that's it. That's all. That's all she wrote. Basically, if you can grow it here, you can grow it anywhere. Whew. I'm going to take a pass on those peppers. Cayenne's hot enough for me. Had your first fresh fig? Yeah, they're nice. They're nice, like biting into the middle of a jelly donut. Because I've seen peppers used for shrubs and rest areas in the southwest as long as they don't freeze. I, yeah, if, if 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 you can avoid a if you can avoid a freeze, peppers are they're they're a perennial plant. Uh, so you know if you if you grow them in a pot and bring them inside or you keep them inside, either way, you, you can keep pepper plants going year round. And whenever we have a permanent permanent uh, hard sided greenhouse. Like a real greenhouse, not a hoop house, because last time we tried that, it just got shredded by the hail. Uh, so the, the plan is eventually we're going to have polycarbonate uh, panes, not not the little thin ones that you can get from Harbor Freight, but, but an actual decent piece of bulletproof glass for our for our greenhouse. I know it's going to cost us. I mean, last time I priced them, I think it was like maybe three by three by six foot was was over a hundred dollars. So. 
Mm. Well, we'll be paying for it, but once we get it and put it in, it'll never have to replace it, and it'll stand up to the hail. And we'll be able to keep some peppers growing year-round. I, I, I like peppers. I like green peppers, too, but it's so hard to get them to, to get decent-sized fruit. If you've got the plant started and it's well-established, has a good established root system, at least here, anyway, um, by the time spring rolls around, then you can get decent-sized peppers out of it. That's kind of cool. I know okra is too. Uh, okra is a perennial plant. Of course, you know we always grow it as a as an annual. Gone double the past year. Oh, Matthew is saying any way to get good pollinators while inside. Not really. I mean, unless you're okay with you know bugs flying around in your house uh, if you, but if you're inside you can um shoot, do i have one over here i often have one just sitting sitting here for no particular reason right um well, no i don't have a cosmetic brush here but you know, if you're in if you're inside you can always just grab a grab a brush uh cosmetic brush is usually what i use this is a paint brush but it'll work too um you know, just like the same brush that that, that the missus and, and 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 the daughters like to use to to apply their blush and everything same thing you just take it and, and and get it on on a flower and get it over to the other flower and and uh you get to to play the role of a bee and that works pretty good and of course the other alternative is to allow the bugs in your house you might ne necessarily want the bugs in your house um <laughs> you have no idea how the pepper pollinates. Um mm, might have some bugs running around in there. Gotta do the roof on the new greenhouse with poly inside and south of the glass. You've got to save that. Nice. Oh well, yeah probably be okay with glass on the on on the side right if it's the south side because usually usually you don't have the hail coming in hard from the south and mason bees mason bees are cool let's see It's a side note, back to drought topic. I'm thinking of making a canopy of shade cloth to deal with increased UV from the sun during this point of the solar cycle. Might not be a bad idea. And this is part of the reasons why, why you know, doing grocery or gardening or food forests and stuff like that, you know, alley cropping, agroforestry, uh, part of the reason why it's good is because the, those, you know, the trees that you've got planted in close proximity to your, your annual crops provide you with shelter, not just from the wind, but also you give them, a little bit of partial shade. Like, there's a lot of things that, that would really like to have some afternoon shade. So having having a, a good hedgerow, of something planted on the west side of wherever you're growing, is a good idea. You know? But if you don't have that, then throw up some shade cloth. You see, one at deep south gently shakes the plants in the high tunnel to fertilize them. Yeah, that works. Um, I was thinking about wait, using my using my invisible pool noodle. Yes, right. I'll take my invisible pool noodle and just just go down the row since it's about four foot long, so I can go and just bop the tassels of the corn as I go down the row. And just pop, 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 and uh, make sure that they get pollinated properly. It's a green pool noodle. That's, that's the reason why it's invisible. <laughs> oh boy it says miss the beginning i have honey locust seed germinating i think honey locusts are larger seeds of black locusts locust, yeah black locusts are small seeds they are edible but you do have to cook them uh to 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 to, to eliminate the toxin that's in them um and uh, honey locusts i don't think you have to cook I'm not sure i could be wrong about that 
but we don't grow any locust around here, so I don't have any experience with it directly. Um, but honey locusts are, are also also a nice a nice tree, good for more good for more northern climates, cooler climes. And actually, I don't have honey locust in the uh, in the tree list at all. I know it's a shock. Um, there, there's there's actually some things that, that 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 aren't in there that are going to leave some space for future books that may not necessarily be things that I'm going to write that somebody should. Uh, there needs to be a a Southwest Food Force book. Somebody should be writing that one, and there needs to be a uh, a Food Force book for the Pacific Northwest. That's going to require its own its own particular treatment. I, some of the stuff from 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 my book will work in the, in the Pacific Northwest, and some of it will work in the in the Northeast as well. But I think that the Tidewater area on the east side of the Appalachian Mountains, all, all along the coast there, deserves its own treatment. I think the uh, the northeast deserves its own treatment. The, the northwest deserves its own treatment. The southwest deserves its own treatment. So there, there are different zones that are different enough in the, in the way things grow that what will generally work in, in the temperate zone needs to be slightly modified and, and, and handled separately. That's just my two cents. But, you know, like saying the seed pods on the locusts were, 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 were large and sticky. Yeah, it sounds like honey locusts. Sean knows the difference by sight. And Vicky's saying it's that deep south has plants dying from the sun's radiation and they bleach and burn. Yeah, but they've got some other problems too. Uh, if, if 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 you look at that video where he's standing next to his corn patch, you can see the um, you can see the track where they drive, and look at look at the look at the surface that they drive on, and look at the surface that they grow in, and there's no difference in the soil there at all. There's no organic matter in it, and of course, since there's no organic matter in it to speak of, it can't retain any moisture any moisture at all. So yeah, the water just goes right through it and it's gone and evapor either sinks through or evaporates out and it's gotten the retention. You have to have you have to have soil organic matter. And that's that's something they're lacking in. Okay. You might have to deal with fire ants, but pour on some wood chips for a season or two and you'll have some soil organic matter. And also plant cover crops. And even if you're you know, even if you're worried, oh no. That clover, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna take up nutrients. No, clover is gonna keep your soil from blowing away with, with the wind. It's going to keep sugars going down to feed your your soil microbial life. It's gonna supply nitrogen. Um, there, there, there's 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 some things that they could be doing there. Putting the, uh, the 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 landscaping fabric down in between rows hasn't helped them out helped them out too much either because yeah, it kills the weeds, but it. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't help with 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 building building the soil life either. The only soil life they've got is the roots of the, of the plants they're trying to grow. So they're they're really dependent upon just what they've got going, and it's you know the the worst examples of, of industrial farming just done on a small scale. And and yeah. So so whenever whenever you get to when you get to it to to a time of drought, you lose everything. That's the lesson that we learned here in, in, in the Great Plains area back during the 1930s. I and mean, this is the reason why uh, my grandfather came down from Kansas and started farming in northeastern Oklahoma. Everything was blowing away and he had to start over fresh. And he got the opportunity to buy a piece of property from somebody that lost their note. You know, this banks were foreclosing left and right. This is also you know, depression era times. Um, if it wasn't for that, he wouldn't have been able to get the, to, to get the, the farm started the way he did. And he started out with uh, uh, water catchment irrigation and creating swales on, con on contour for, for soil retention, planting those up with, with trees and shrubs and stuff like that. And this is really very early on permaculture stuff that's you know, ages and ages before uh, somebody was calling it that. David's asking, is wheat or rye do good in Oklahoma? Hmm. I mean, they do, but um, 
That wasn't wrong. <laughs> That's what saying. Are honey locusts and nitrogen fixer? Yes. Both honey locusts and black locusts are nitrogen fixer. Nitrogen fixers. Uh, most of the time, as I, oh, I said, I was going to mention this. Um, most of the time, whenever you're encountering things like thorns and defensive mechanisms on plants like that, uh, you find those on nitrogen fixers. So you, you find thorns on things like your Siberian pea shrub. You find thorns on your uh, on all the members of the of the Iliagnus, uh, the Iliagnacea Ili family. So they'll you see buckthorns, um, uh, Iliagnus, Angustifolia, silver thorns, gummy berries. All of those have thorns on them. And I think the reason why you wind up seeing those is because they have such a, a high concentration of, of nutrients in them, being pioneers the way they are. They become very attractive for. Uh, for, for, for the grazing critters to come out and eat. So in order for them to survive and keep on doing the thing that they're supposed to be doing, they develop those thorns to protect them. But not everything with thorns is a nitrogen fix. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a, a, a decent um, defense mechanism. Like roses, for example, they have thorns. They're not nitrogen fixers. So that's I think Jeevan suggests growing over 50% biomass to go back into the soil. Whew, that's a lot, but you, you, yeah, you, you've got, you've got to, you've got to replace your soil organic matter, especially if you're, if you're doing things that depletes the soil of it. Intensive growing depletes organic matter like nothing else. Matthew is saying, any experience with using corn gluten meal as a natural pre-emergent? No, I have never tried that. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing gar There's enough garbage needed in the human industry. They don't need to do anything else. Um, well, there's okay. So, I guess we'll talk about chemtrails. Why not? That's uh, geoengineering is, what is, is the term for it. Attempting to do something about uh, about temperatures by putting uh, usually sulfur dioxide and other things into the atmosphere, aerialized form, just right up there at the edge of the stratosphere. That was the idea. And, and it's based upon the idea that, uh, that volcanoes, whenever they have eruptions, can send those plumes of things like sulfur dioxide, other, other particles, and small particle size, into the stratosphere and it will stay up there and it'll it'll cause especially sulfur dioxide because of the the um, the wavelength of light that it reflects it reflects a lot of uv um it's supposed to reflect sunlight to create shade to create cooler temperatures below but what they discovered is that uh the particles don't stay suspended in the atmosphere long enough to have any any serious impact 50% of them are gone within the first 24 hours. Another 50% are gone within the next 24 hours. And over the next week, most of them settle out to the point where you would have to be constantly going up there and spreading particles in order to do anything significant at all, which is way too expensive. Not to mention the, the, just the fuel that you'd be planning to get it accomplished in the first place. It's so... It's so improbable that you'd be able to accomplish anything and they've already experimented with it that whenever you see somebody or somebody flying overhead and you see a trail of something behind the airplane no it's not chemicals being sprayed it's a contrail <laughs> even though there may be stupid people they're not wealthy enough and don't have enough sulfur dioxide to be able to do what you imagine that they're doing I wouldn't worry about that. But that doesn't mean that they don't spray things like pesticides and herbicides and other stuff much closer to the ground. And those can create problems whenever they 
they get beyond the fields that they're supposed to be in. They get into 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 our gardens, which is no, no fun. Um, so David's saying a little research I've done found that luminar water could be added to the fuel to increase fuel economy. For the lemon dust could be a byproduct of plants. Yeah, yeah, could be. And let's face it, there's there's a lot of aluminum all over the place. Um, your 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 common bentonite clay is is an aluminum an aluminum oxide uh, bonded with silicon. It's a, it's a silica hydrate with aluminum in it. So there's aluminum all over the place. This isn't really a big problem as long as uh, your pH range stays between that you know 6.5 to 7.5 range, right around where you want it to be to be growing stuff. You wind up with two two basic or two acidic pH levels, then you can wind up with, with worries about uh, picking up metal toxicity. But under most circumstances, it's not going to be an issue. If it is going to be an issue, you, you've got bigger problems than just the aluminum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awkward humans here, late to the game, but you're here. Yeah, there are volcanoes, and then there's volcanoes. And some burr on Krakatoa did disrupt the weather. Yeah, and, and, and those, those were massive, massive eruptions and, and extended eruptions, so. Uh, under most circumstances, you you don't wind up with having, uh, and even from the volcanoes, you don't ha wind up having enough of those particles that stay up long enough to do much of anything significant. And th they certainly can't do it by by loading up a tank full of full of chemicals and getting up there into, into the stratosphere and, and spraying the stuff. I mean, it was it was a nice idea. They experimented with it. They found out that it, it, it's it's not it's not effective, and then they stopped doing it. So people are still talking about chemtrails, chemtrails, chemtrails. Like the experiment is over. It's been over for decades. <laughs> They're not doing it anymore because it doesn't work. Boyd's going to bed. So video all about the lead and gasoline. That was yeah. It was, it was intended to, to 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 reduce knocking, if I'm not not mistaken. It was supposed to be an anti-knock uh, compound. Nope. <laughs> Spread politicians through the air. Yeah, yeah. Well, guys, been about an hour and a half. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get my air conditioner turned back on because it's still over 80 degrees here in northeastern Oklahoma, and I'm uh, a little bit sweaty over here. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, if you found it, found it entertaining or informative, you know what to do. I'll catch you next time, and until then, get out there, guys, and get growing. <laughs>